Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, 12th chapter of the great book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to finish it today. You know, remember how this particular chapter started. It says, remember your Creator in your youth. You, you better enjoy Him. When, and then it continues on as to what happens to our flesh bodies. And the interesting point of this is that you have two bodies. And that has been taught from chapter 1 all the way through. And when you must realize that it is the spiritual body, that age doesn't mean anything. So it's been picking them off here in this chapter down to verse 5, that uh, the grinders don't grind so well, meaning your teeth, they're a little thinner, and they, they don't work like they used to. The eyes are, are not as bright. They can't see as well. And the ears, they, they don't hear quite as well either. Music, everybody turns the music down low, meaning you can't hardly hear it. So uh, it is true that these flesh bodies, um, they get old. Now, that could be, that could be upsetting to some people. But it shouldn't be. Remember the Creator, always having there. Because our body that we're going to find here in a moment that you go into but when you leave the flesh body, age doesn't mean anything to it. Disease doesn't mean anything to it. Why? Because it's impossible for it to be diseased or aged. Even uh, angels that appeared to Mary and um, others were always young people. They were as old as we are. That is from the first earth age. But age does not show or have any effect whatsoever on a spiritual body. God created that spiritual body something else. It doesn't uh, age, it doesn't wither, it doesn't get sick. And that's what you step into. So uh, really, um, it, he did a pretty good job on these flesh bodies. When you take care of them properly, they, they last quite a while. As, as long as your duties are uh, needed by Almighty God here on earth. So uh, it continues on then describing what can happen to a flesh body ultimately. Don't, do not let it um, put you down, but rather let it put you up, because you have something far better, especially if you remember the Creator and if you're following Him. So, to finish the book, Ecclesiastes, Kehofalith, uh, in the Hebrew tongue, meaning the, the um, preacher or the convener, he that pulls people together to hear the Word of God. Chapter uh, 12, verse 5, let's go with it. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high. I mean, their balance is not as good, and they can trip and fall, and you're very, a lot more careful in high places uh, when you're older. And fears shall be in the way. The way is always a path or a journey. You're a little more concerned. You don't journey like you did in your younger days, uh, free, happy, and here you go. But you have to take care of the old body, so things don't go quite as well on a journey as they did in the younger days. And the almond tree shall flourish. The, the old hair will turn white, and it's supposed to symbolize um, wisdom, but it, in some cases, maybe it does. In some cases, maybe it doesn't. And the grasshopper, or translated locust, the locust shall be a burden 
and and um, uh, and, and so it is. And desire shall fail. <clears throat> that means your passions will diminish with old age, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Well, what is your long home? Well, it, it means your home for an eternity, for a long, 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 long time. It means you could even call it the grave if you wanted to, but it's your home. <clears throat> Excuse me, and you're going to go there. And it is uh, the time, again, as I, I'm repeating myself, but it's essential to know time means nothing there. So sometimes we hang on and hang on and hang on with dread when really it's a time to rejoice. So we have a beautiful long home in the... Um, the locusts or anything even that would bother can get to be a burden. You just, you don't want trouble because it's hard to take care of. And your, your age prevents you many times from participating in taking care of business like you really should. It can get to be a problem. So there, there you have it. And, and that old long home is something really you can look forward to. There, everything is just about perfect. And you earn it. That's your reward from Almighty God. And how precious it is. Verse 6 to continue. Or, rather, ever the silver cord be loosed. That's the spinal cord. If it should break, or the golden bowl be broken, that's your skull, your head, if you should receive a deadly wound, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. The cistern, naturally, the, the, um, the um, pitcher is what you draw water from, from the deep well, and um, so that's kind of the old pump, the heart. It, it takes care of pumping up from um, the metabolism that keeps the flesh body going. And here, it, it, these parts of the body basically are used in a symbolic way that naturally, if you sever the spinal cord in an accident, you're paralyzed. <clears throat> or if you receive a deadly head wound, or if your heart quits, you're, you're ready for the transition. But, but what happens? This is what's important. What happens when the flesh body stops metabolism? That means um, biological or chemical death. Either one, they're only about three or four minutes apart. And so I'll well, make that about six minutes apart. And let's take verse 7 to cap it off. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. I mean, everything you have eaten is of organic nature, meaning it came from dirt. And the dirt's going back. The flesh body is going back to dust. Uh, and the spirit, the spirit is the intellect of your soul, meaning your spiritual body shall return unto God who gave it. Where did you come from? You came from God. Where do you return to? You go back to Him. Now, that's for those that went, go to the long house for the long period of time. And uh, certainly, uh, always remember, if you have doubts about that, remember 1 Corinthians 15, verse 44 in the New Testament. You've got two bodies. You've got a spiritual body that dwells within this flesh body, and then you have the flesh body. It's, it's, it's dust. It's organic. And uh, certainly when, when the home for even the spiritual body as you walk the earth today under the sun, as this book is written to, meaning that you are alive in a flesh body, that spiritual body dwells within. But the instant... When, when you die, 
that spirit body returns to the Father from whence it came for an eternity if, if you overcome. Now, this, this is made very clear and is misunderstood by many in, in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 goes into great detail about this. But unfortunately, many people misinterpret it to mean something totally different. So let us let God's word speak. And let us receive his word as it is written from the mouth of the living God. So we go to, this is where many people have the, get the so-called rapture doctrine. And the word rapture is not even here. This is not part of the subject. It has no object. But let's find out what the subject and the object are. Verse 13, chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians. <clears throat> but I would not have you to be ignorant. You understand that? God doesn't want you to be ignorant. He doesn't want you believing something that is false. Brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That means dead. that you sorrow not. You don't have to weep or carry on if you mourn, but even as others which have no hope. Why? Because you better have hope. You know where they went. They returned to the Father. That's what Ecclesiastes is talking about, and that's why you can have hope, and that's why you shouldn't weep all that much, because they're with the Lord. Don't be ignorant about that. Verse 14. For if we believe, here, here comes the reason and the truth. Listen to it. For if we believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again, even so them also which sleep or, 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 have, or, or die in Jesus will God bring with him. So if God brings them with him, and he's coming from heaven, where are they? They're with him. They return to the Father from which they came. <clears throat> God created man for, for his pleasure. And naturally, those that overcome, he wants them with him. And that's where they are. Now, there's nothing complicated about that. Because if you believe Christ rose from the dead, but if you didn't, you wouldn't even be a Christian. You would say he was still out here in a grave somewhere. But he resurrected and appeared to many, performed miracles even then, and um, walked with man and for 40 days. And certainly, um, that's what it's talking about here. Verse 15, to continue. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. What word is this again? By the word of the Lord. Now some man, the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, how, how is it that we wouldn't prevent those that are dead? Because they're already gone. There's no way, prevent means proceed. There's no way you could proceed those that have already died because they're already out of here. They're with the Father. Isn't it sad that some people preach they're out here in a hole in the ground and they don't realize they had two bodies. That's the subject here. <clears throat> one went back to dust and your real body, the one you came here with, has returned to the Father, and you are as you were, and certainly uh, being with the Father, enjoying his love. But what it, what it means is, and that's just common sense, if you believe Christ died and rose from the grave, then you better believe that everyone else that has died has risen also. They're with him. Now, we know from paradise there is a gulf there. And some are there for judgment on the wrong side of the gulf. And the others are in the bosom of Abraham. That is to say, in God's presence because they overcame. 
But we have the millennium to go through to work out some hitches, and so it is. Why? Because God loves his children. Verse 16, to continue. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel. Which one? The seventh. And with the trump of God, the seventh trump, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Notice the colon, the dead in Christ rise first. Why? Because they're already gone. They're out of here. So don't, don't misread that or run it together, separate it, rightly dividing the word of God to show yourself approved so that you are clear <clears throat> in knowing and understanding that you have two bodies. One is flesh that walks under the sun. That's what the book of, of Ecclesiastes is about, telling you how to be happy in that body. And But knowing all the time your hope as you look forward, is returning to Almighty God. And he's going to return here to take care of business, but still in the dimension of Savior for a thousand years. A different subject for a different time. Verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me, this word air is not like atmosphere or space. This word air is the air you breathe, it's the breath of life. It um, comes from the actual air that you breathe that keeps you alive. And as it is, um, <clears throat> that is the um, spiritual body, because it is called wind. The, the spirit is ruach, wind. Spirit in the uh, Greek tongue is pneuma, uh, which means air. <clears throat> and that's what we change into, excuse me. But there's nothing complicated about that. And then Paul started out, hey, don't be ignorant about this. Don't let some man tell you fairy tales that mislead you. Well, well they, my preacher told me that means the rapture. Where, where did, did we miss something? Did, did we miss, was the word rapture in there? Did I miss it somewhere? Uh, and if I were to read it to you in the Greek tongue, it still wouldn't be there. If I read it to you in the Aramaic tongue, it still wouldn't be there. It doesn't exist. So don't be ignorant. You see, the saddest, saddest thing about those that would let someone twist this, do not go on to do a study into the chronological order of events of what happens at the sixth trump. They only look at the seventh. The sixth trump, the false Christ comes, claiming he has come to fly him away. And they're going to jump on his wagon because they think it is the Christ. That's why it's a very dangerous thing to be ignorant of the simplicity in which God draws forth here the determination and the duty of two bodies, how that works. It's a very simple thing. You have a flesh body, you have a spiritual body. The spiritual body is going back where it came from. The flesh body, you don't need it anymore. It, everything from the time your mother conceived you in her womb when she partook of something, it was from the dust, meaning it was organic. We don't, we don't mess around and partake in raw metals and things that are not organic. That would destroy a flesh body. So when, when, you, when it is organic, it goes back to, to dust from which it came, and so it is. Uh, now let's continue with the next verse in this particular chapter, verse 18. 
Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And it is a great comfort. You got hope. Then you know you're going to return to the Father. Our Father is not the Father of dead, the dead, but of the living. Not even Satan has died. Okay. He's, he's locked right in heaven. Michael and his angels are guarding him and his angels. <clears throat> no one will die until the great white throne judgment. Satan, some of his offices will die. God will cast them out, and he will not be allowed that power. But Satan himself will not be destroyed, turned to ashes from within, until the great white throne judgment, which takes part in Revelation chapter 20, the last verses, which is the second death, which means the death of the soul, the death of the spirit body, not just the flesh, which is organic, but that final judgment can bring death to the spirit body. God spoke and nothing became something. He can speak and something can become nothing. <clears throat> I can only put it in one other way. We will not miss them. They will be blotted out. That means erased. Erased from your mind. Erased from your thought. And you will only have happy things in the heaven that our Father provides for us, the eternity, the longhouse, right here on earth. You know, uh, many people, they like to make this complicated, and there's nothing complicated about it. And that is to say, our Father's Word, the Word of God, and, and how we um, live therein. Now we're going to return to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And we'll pick it up in verse 8 as we continue. Again, I'm going to insist, don't ever let anyone twist God's word out of shape where you can't understand the simplicity in which he brought that. Verse 8 and in um, the 12th chapter of the great book of Ecclesiastes, and it reads, Vanity of vanities saith the preacher, all is vanity. If you look at it from the flesh angle, and that's all, that's what you got. It's empty, empty, empty. Verse 9, and moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs where they couldn't be misunderstood. A proverb can be something very complicated if, if you do not have eyes to see or ears to hear. But God's elect will always see and hear. And Kokolith uh, will put that in order. That's to say the, the name in the Hebrew for the preacher. He's wise. Where, where did that wisdom come from? It comes from our Father. All wisdom comes from God. And uh, to be able to understand and to simplify the Proverbs, then certainly, uh, and the parables, it makes life so much better. We have hope. We have hope in the long home. That's the eternal life. Verse 10 to continue. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. He tried to find suitable words to express and explain the word of God, which is naturally the words of truth. God's word is always true. That's what truth is. Verse 11, to continue. The words of the wise are as goads, and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. Do you, do you know what a goad is? A goad is a nail on the end of a stick, and when you're a shepherd, or, or even driving cattle, 
when you, if some cattle or if some uh, animal lags behind, sometimes you may have to goose them with that uh, nail just a little bit. And this is why, this is what Christ said to Paul when old Paul was being so stubborn on the road to Damascus that day. He asked Paul, why do you kick against the pricks? That means, why do you kick against that goat? All, all it's going to do is hurt you worse. And, and that's as it is, as God corrects you, don't kick against that goat. You're, all you do is drive the nail home and deeper. All you do is hurt yourself. It's so much easier to listen to the shepherd. And, and the shepherd, the Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. And, and so it is. And he leads us beside green pastures, meaning he provides us wisdom and good food from his word, truth of that word. And it, unless you are stubborn, he never has to use that goad. But if you got it coming and your soul is being put at risk, he may use that goad on you. Now, that, that is symbolic because he, he may, if you ask for trouble, he may let you enjoy it for a while. Okay. So you want to be careful what you ask for. Our Father is on the throne. He's in control, and, and so it is. Uh, let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 12. And further, by these, my son... Be admonished. Listen to it. Of making many books, there is no end. Much study is a weariness of the flesh. I mean, you, you never set yourself up a study time, and, and uh, every hour you should at least take a five-minute break or maybe even a ten. It's according to who you are. Don't, in other words, I'll say my old saying, don't overload your donkey, okay? You, you, you can only absorb so much. And when you need that break, stop. And you're weary. Rest a moment. Let your mind absorb what you've got. That's called meditation, like a, chow, a cow chewing her cud. You meditate on what you've covered wisely and with understanding, and pace yourself as you should. And, and this goes for the preacher. Don't stand up in a pulpit and preach for three hours. It's, you would be boring, they would be weary, and they would not like to hear you again. Because you have, you have uh, overdone yourself. And, and you've loaded them up with so much information they could not retain it, and they would tune you out. You've got to use common sense. Verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. You want to know what the conclusion is? Listen. Fear God. That's revere. It means to love him. And keep his commandments. You, you do what he asks you to do. For this is the whole duty of man. When man follows those things, that's how simple it is. It's pleasing to God. And God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Verse 14, to complete the book. For God shall bring every work into judgment. He's the judge. With every secret Thing, nothing hidden, whether it be good or whether it be evil. He, he's the judge of judges. It's complete. We wouldn't have him any other way because that means he is fair. And when you get a fair shake, you've got no room to complain. So, again, after all is said and done in the flesh body, it comes down Wisdom really simplifies it. Here's the conclusion of the whole matter, the whole, whole thing. 
love your father. The word fear will translate revere or fear. You revere the father and keep his commandments. His commandments are pretty easy to follow. It keeps you out of trouble. When you don't go with his commandments, you're in a heap of hurt. This is the whole duty of man. That's meaning what? That's all God expects of you, is to follow his word, to do the best you can. Again, if you leave God out of the equation of your life, if you, with just your flesh body, try to get out there and get it all by yourself, you're going, you're going to be one miserable individual. But when you bring the Heavenly Father, the Creator, into your life, into the equation of your life, it makes all the difference in the world. Because He will keep you out of trouble. And man, when he goes without God, is trouble going somewhere to happen. So it, it's a very simple thing. Ecclesiastes, written to the man that walks under the sun, whereby when you bring God into your life, you can find happiness. I hope you enjoyed the book as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. You listen a moment, won't you please? The book of Ezekiel. What a fantastic study, this book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel, that covers, if you would, those vehicles, those circular discs. In the Hebrew, it states very clearly that that whirlwind with the color amber traced back to the Hebrew, highly polished bronze. What an exciting thing that God's Word informs us on all things. Ezekiel, one of my favorite prophets of the Bible, probably more written, not probably, but absolutely more written on what will happen in the millennium age than even the book of Revelation. Ezekiel guiding you through it, what God will expect at the final battle, Armageddon and Haman Gog, recorded in this great prophecy. I know you're going to enjoy it. The book of Ezekiel. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? And um, it's, it's always good to hear from you. But please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We're not going to judge people. Why? It's against God's rules. He's the judge. All, all you do is discern right from wrong, from his word and his teachings, and you'll do just fine. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And um, the uh, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. I, I am amazed. I we did a printout on how many people listen to us by by um, the internet and how many nations. It's awesome. And again, still yet in this count. China is still number three as far as nations having people that listen to us. So bless you and thank you for listening. There is at least um, most all nations in the world listen to us, a certain amount of people there. Uh, listen to, I should say, the word of God. They're hungry for it. And God bless you. We, we remember you all. Okay, and those of you now that um, if you have a prayer request, you don't need that number. And you don't need an address. Uh, he knows what you're thinking. You don't even have to say it out loud. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. <clears throat> Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Linda from Kentucky. I know I need God and I feel him around me, but how do I go about receiving him? I love him and I want him to be in my life. What do I need to do? 
Well, I think you're doing it right. You need to repent first. Because when you repent, you unload all your sins. Now, Linda, God's going to forgive you your sins when you repent honestly. I want you to forgive yourself. Because I sense maybe Linda's thinking she's maybe not good enough for God. You are. You're his daughter. He loves you. So repent and find that peace. And, and remember, he said you can feel him around you. That's his promise. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Okay, Sylvia from um, Mexico, from Maine. Uh, I think that's where that's at. When people judge you for what you have instead of who you are, is there scripture regarding that? People don't associate with you because you don't have good things like a car that uh, does not work. Um, if, if I were to depend on friends that accepted me because I had a car, that wouldn't be much of a friend. Uh, the scripture probably you're looking for is Acts chapter 10, verse 34. I'll say it again for you. Acts chapter 10, verse 34. God is not a respecter of persons. That is to say about how much you have or you're much better than anyone else. He loves us all the same. So, uh, I mean, thinks thou worriest too much about what other people think. Hey, don't worry about it. It, it is what is between you and the Father that counts. And if you please Father, it will please the people it's supposed to and the others. We don't care. Let them go. Don't need them uh, and until at least maybe down the road they'll grow up someday. But don't worry too much about what people think. God loves you. We do too. Martin from Texas. When do you receive the Holy Spirit? When you're baptized? No, when you believe. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever would believe upon him should not perish, but would have eternal life. And, and, uh, so, and so it is. It doesn't say when you're baptized. It's good to be baptized. Christ was baptized, and he, he always sets the way for us to follow. And certainly um, it is good to be baptized. But the Holy Spirit comes when you believe. He comes... Uh, and he abides with you, in you, and you and he, him. And certainly, what is the Holy Spirit? It's God's Spirit. And, and, um, and he, he loves you, and that's expressing his love. Dana from Texas. If the tribes that went over the Caucasus Mountains already had their native languages, how and why did people start talking in English? Well, well, not too many of them do speak in English. There are many of those tribes that came over. Uh, let, let's take um, Reuben, Reuben, I've been thinking, the Dutch. Uh, they don't speak English. Now, it is true that many of them have a second language, and that second language is English. And English is kind of an accepted language because of aviation. We have to be able to communicate around the world, and usually avi aviation has brought English to the foreground. But that doesn't, almost all the, the tribes have a language of their own. And um, they do, even, if you want to know, even the Irish, many would say, well, I speak English. You know, but do you know what their native tongue is? It's Gaelic. And when, when you're translating the Ogham language, the uh, Ogham is the alphabet, but the language, if, if you can't translate Gaelic, you're not going to do any good with it because that's what, it, that's what they spoke. So there are many languages there. Mark from Missouri. 
if you don't get saved while you are alive, do you get another chance for relatives uh, to help you before you go to hell? Well, I, you know, I would sure hate to bet my, my um, uh, eternal soul on that. Besides, how can you help lo not loving our Father who put everything before us? And all you have to do is reach out and take it and find happiness and contentment. And without it, it's misery, trouble, and um, not having that eternal hope. Why would you rob yourself that way? You could have a complete life as the man that walks into the sun bringing God into the equation. And Mark, what, what good are you? Are, are you expecting your family to pull you out of it? Or are you a man of God that can help pull your family out of it? You get cracking. You get a hold of your bootstraps and you pull yourself up. And you talk to the Father. Don't depend on your family pulling you out. You be man enough to be pull some of them out by accepting our Heavenly Father. Uh, and so it is. There'll be many who say, well, you were really hard on him. Hey, I, he needed it. Because he's, you know, he, that, that is a person that depends on others to pull them out. Um, and, and he's a good man. He needs to act like it. Uh, Rick from Tennessee, question. Do you think Melchizedek was the earthly form of Michael the Archangel? Absolutely not. What, what does it mean? Translate it. That's, that's, that's where your problem is, apparently, because the translation sure won't fit Michael the Archangel. Michael the Archangel is the angel of Israel. Beautiful angel. Wonderful angel. Melchizedek. Melka is king and Zedek is the just. And Michael is not a king. He's an angel. An archangel. We won't take that away from him. And, uh, but then who is it talking about? You mean you don't know who the king of kings and lord of lords is? That's Melchizedek. And certainly, if you read Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3, let you know who it is. He's like the Son of God. Why? Because he was the Son of God. Um, okay, we're going to go with um, Felicia and um, Felicia uh, from uh, Delaware. Recently, I wrote a letter asking the question, what does it mean to be born again, and where would I find it in the Bible? My letter never seems to make it where my questions can be answered. But you're getting it this time, okay? Um, you, you'll find born again in the third chapter of St. John. Okay. And it will say that Christ said, you must be born again. But that's not what the manuscripts say, and I don't want to confuse you. The manuscripts say you must be born from above, meaning you're, you're born from above, meaning you came from above, born in a woman's womb, you were given birth, and, um, and you were here. Well, what is, why would God say that? Because of the fallen angels that came not born of woman, and wreck God's plan of eternal salvation until he had to destroy them with the flood. So it's important to be born from above. Um, Carissa from the Bahamas. My question, when the fallen angels came down from heaven and seduced women and hybrids were created, were the hybrids in a spiritual form Therefore, have, how are we, here, 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 there were no remains such as skeletal artifacts found in the uh, rocks, or, and they were called giants, meaning they were above average height, 8 to 10 foot, 
or were they that much taller? Well, let's take Goliath. He was a meters, let me see, he was ten and a half feet tall. David was just a little taller, but he took him with a sling stone. There, there's, uh, when you say there are no remains, uh, 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 that is true enough. There have been some, though, that skulls found that are pretty whoppers. Uh, but have you ever heard of Petra? Have you ever seen pictures of Petra, how big those doors are? The land of the giants? And uh, certainly um, their, their remains are the, the, the uh, living quarters are there. They truly existed. Otherwise, we would not have had the flood of milk, okay? So um, it is, um, it's good to hear from you. They were hybrids, and they were in the flesh because, you know, man was made in the exact image of God and the angels. Therefore, an angel is in the exact image of a man. A man can impregnate a woman, so can they. Deborah from Colorado. Where in the Bible does it say if we kill someone, send them to God? If, if someone is a murderer, you send them to God. You practice capital punishment. You, you'll find it in Deuteronomy chapter 19 and in Numbers 35. God will even take it one step further. He will say, if, if somebody is just mean, ornery, mean, and they lie in wait. They plan it. It's premeditated. And they murder a man for no reason at all. I mean, the man is innocent. That makes him a murderer. And then God says, practice capital punishment. Others will see, and these things will cease happening among you. When we fail to do that, Things are going to keep happening among us. God even goes it one step further. He says, don't you feel bad about it? It's on me. I'm the one that orders it. And certainly, uh, he is the chief judge, and he's the one that will have the main trial. Penny from Michigan. What biblical passage is the mark of the beast? Well, you'll find it in Revelation chapter 13. From verse 11 to the end, it's speaking of a religious uh, creature who is none other than the false messiah. And he says he looks like the Lamb of God. And he even has horns. That means power. Looks just like Christ, in other words. But whoa, what is his voice? It's the voice of a dragon meaning it's Satan trying to play Jesus. And those that believe upon him, they receive a mark, not on their face, or in, but in their forehead. They worship him. Or in their right hand means they're, they're church workers. They're going to get in and work in his church. Can you imagine working in Satan's church and expecting rewards? Satan's got a reward for you, all right? Uh, he likes company where he's going. Lisa from Tennessee, can you please explain to me what the deadly wound is in Revelation? Thank you so very much. The deadly wound is spoken of in Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. And what it is, it's a, who receives the wound, number one? That's the way you tell. It's a one-world political system. Well, then how does a one world political system receive a deadly wound. Well, it's not some individual getting his head whacked. Okay. It's a political organization that falls apart, boom, just, I mean, it fails. Um, you don't have to look very far today to see political organizations that kind of, I mean, they take our nation and destroy it. So, or try to, it's not gonna happen. God's still on the throne. But it means a one-world political system will receive a deadly wound, but the false Christ shows up instantly, heals it, and with, has a chicken for every pot. 
He comes in, in other words, prosperously and peacefully, as it's written in the great book of Daniel. Uh, Joy from South Dakota. The church I attend, um, I don't usually judge what churches do. The church I attend teaches that in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. And that is what Matthew 24, Mark 13 is talking about. And it has already happened. I don't believe this as I study with you, but I would like your opinion on that. Well, in as much as you didn't mention the church name, then I will, I will address it. There, there are, it is not an uncommon thing for them to teach that. There, there was a little tin horn Roman general named Titus that in 70 AD did come in, but it has absolutely nothing to do was Mark 13 or Matthew 24. They, they um, happen during the parable of the fig tree. That's why Jesus said, not maybe you should learn the parable, but to learn it so that you could. Uh, and if you were to read the first verse 3 of Matthew 24, they ask the question, what is the signs of your return, Christ's return? Not some Roman general, okay. So it just won't fit, and they're misleading themselves. Uh, I'm glad you're not being taken in by it. Uh, Eddie from California. I understand that women, women are commanded to keep quiet in church. Does this mean that a woman should not be a minister? Uh, may I correct you? When you go to the Greek manuscripts, and you read what is actually written. It says a woman should not chatter in church. Well, I got some news for you. A man shouldn't chatter in church while it's meeting, nor should a, a child. I won't put up with it. Man, woman, child, or whoever, there's not going to be any chattering when God's word is being taught. So, therefore, it is written in... Um, Acts chapter 2, that both sons and daughters shall prophesy and teach. It is written in the Old Testament, in the great book of Joel, in chapter 2, that both my sons and my daughters will prophesy. So, and, and how about um, Nathan's four daughters? They were virgins. But they were all prophetists, meaning they were teachers. So uh, man has a nice way of um, maybe, maybe some, I don't know, maybe some men are jealous of that women might make a better preacher than they are. I don't know. Be that as it may, time will tell, will it not? Joy from South Dakota, what are your thoughts about praying to saints and apostles? No. We said today that the summation was to follow God's orders and commandments. What did Christ command about this? How do we pray, the apostles said. And this is what he said. Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, his kingdom is coming to earth, just like it is in heaven. But you pray to our Father, not to some entity, okay? And you pray in Christ's name, giving credentials that you are a Christian. For Christ is none other than Emmanuel, which is to say God with us. Uh, Doris from Pennsylvania. Is the Passover date that we celebrate the day that Christ rose from the dead? That's what the celebration is. He has risen. And when it means that that is so very important for the fact that he has risen means we're going to. Today's lecture made that very clear. If you believe Christ rose, then know that all your ancestors that have passed away and mourned for have risen also. They're with him. 
how precious that is. Uh, Virginia from Georgia. I would like to know if you believe in speaking in tongues. Well, um, yes, I do. Acts chapter 2, it states very clearly that when, when that time comes, that uh, the Pentecostal tongue will be spoken. And you can read of it in the book of Joel, okay? Because this is what Peter would say. This is that that was spoken of by Joel the prophet. But you see, it was an unknown. You will not find the word unknown in Acts chapter 2 about the Pentecostal tongue. Just the opposite. Every language in the world understood it. Why? Because it was the Holy Spirit speaking. Now, we, we are told in 1 Corinthians 14 that I, as a minister, I go to Sidadi Miheko then they do not understand English all that much. So I'm supposed to take an interpreter with me so they can hear the word of God, okay? That is a, a tongue, yes, and you need an interpreter. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's word. Most of all, God loves you for it. It makes his day. When you get into the manuscripts that he sent to you, the letter, telling you how to make him happy and, and yourself happy. So don't, you make his day, he'll make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God, he will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. John, three letters written by the Apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with, my little children, or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love and we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. He also writes, this is love, that we walk after his commandments, after these words of encouragement. John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the Epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray.
From Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, study in God's Word. Now, here's Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to continue Satan's bargains. Let me just recap just a little bit what we discovered in the first half of this lecture, uh, this set of lectures, was that Satan will even use your love for Christ, such as he did Peter, when he announced to the disciples, we're going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be in the tomb.